So Coleridge was an avid reader. And he boasted to one of his friends that he reminded himself of a library cormorant, uh, meaning that he devoured books as this particular bird devoured fish. Not only did he read avidly and widely, but he tended to be drawn to texts that we would probably call outlandish or exotic. This is true of his philosophical interests. He was deeply um, into rather obscure Neoplatonic philosophers, for instance, like Iamblichus. He also enjoyed 17th century British prose writers uh, famous for their Baroque winding labyrinthine prose, such as uh, Robert Burton, Anatomy of Melancholy, and Sir Thomas Brown, um, author of all sorts of books on all sorts of subjects, ranging from burial urns to the figure of the quincunx and how it appears in nature. But another way that Coleridge expressed his interest in all out-of-the-way books was his avid reading and travel writing. He was really interested in accounts of exotic lands. And so he would have been very much aware in writing The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, 1797, 1798, mostly 1798, he would have been very much aware of accounts of the Antarctic. Until the 1770s, no European had actually penetrated the Antarctic Circle at all. So all geographical accounts of the Antarctic were purely speculative. Now the history of, let's call it speculative geography, concerning the Antarctic is really quite fascinating. And early in the poem, The Round the Ancient Mariner, we see the mariner going through a sort of catalog of different accounts of the Antarctic that had appeared in the travel narratives that Coleridge himself likely would have been aware of. So we can begin by thinking about the very earliest accounts of the Antarctic in ancient Greek texts, where the Antarctic was referred to as the Antipodes, which literally translates to walking the other way, suggesting that the Antarctic appeared to those living in the so-called Western Hemisphere to be the exact opposite of everything that was true of their world. So, so the Antarctic, from the beginning, it was a counterworld. Another word used to define the Antarctic um, in ancient Greece was the autokathon, um, which means suggests it was alien or other. So we need to be clear on this, that from the very beginning of geographical speculation in the West, the Antarctic was a sort of um, repository for people's fantasies about what was opposite of the known. Now this continued in more concrete ways in, in the Middle Ages. If you look at some medieval maps, uh, you'll see a, a, a vast area um, pointing to the Antarctic with simply one word, frigida, I'm frozen. Or maybe you'd see a map with another word, perusta, burned. The idea being that the Antarctic is a kind of unmapped, unmappable waste. Uh, if everything is frozen, there's a suggestion that there is chaos because in a frozen landscape, it's difficult to tell one thing from the other. Um, it's a reduction of all difference to the same. Um, same with the landscape on fire, a reduction of difference to the same and indeed, that's what chaos is, the inability to make meaningful distinctions uh, in, in a given space. But there were other medieval maps that, that depicted the uh, Antarctic even more uh, imaginatively, we might say. Uh, some, some map makers and travel writers imagined the um, Antarctic as a place where monsters dwelled, maybe 14 races of monsters, maybe 12, maybe 10, depending on the, um, the writer. And these monsters tended to be um, creatures that collapsed distinctions that humans need for smooth operation in the everyday world. For instance, one group, the Anthrophagi, um, had heads where their chests should be. Uh, so there's this blurring of normal distinctions. A human being has a head above the chest. You press the head into the chest, there, there's a loss of that meaningful distinction. Uh, another race of monsters had dog, dog heads for heads, again, a blurring of, of human and animal. So the idea that the Antarctic is the monstrous, the monstrous other, the freakish, uh, the grotesque, 
So basically until what we call the early modern phase, this is what the Antarctic was, a, a repository for the other, otherness, alienness, the monstrous, the chaotic, the unknown. But what happens in the, in the so-called early modern age, uh, people start sailing down south. They actually start sailing around south, down below South America. And it's, it's seen immediately that, whoa, this is not a, a cold area at all. In fact, it's a very warm area. And it's an area with lots of uh, really, really, really beautiful uh, trees and um, lush valleys and rivers. So maybe the Antarctic isn't a waste or monstrous at all. Maybe it's a paradise. Maybe this is Eden. Maybe Adam and Eve are here. This is what was thought. Um, at the very least, it was thought there might be a kind of El Dorado or, or, or land of treasure or eternal youth. So suddenly the Antarctic goes from a realm of hellishness to a realm of a possible paradise. Well, by the time Captain Cook actually crossed the um, Antarctic Circle in the 1770s, uh, all these fantasies are routed. Um, Cap uh, Captain James Cook says, look, when I get down here, I can't tell the difference between land and ice. I don't even know if there's land down here at all. It might all be ice. It might all be frozen sea. I can't tell. And the very sky itself is so filled with mist that I can't tell the difference between um, earth and sky. In other words, it's, it's, it's a realm that is, that is blank, that is, that is devoid of all meaning. And this is its horror, not that it is monstrous uh, or chaotic, but that it, that it negates all effort to make any sort of meaningful claim about it. So he says, James Cook, don't come down here. There's nothing for you here. Uh, we can't capitalize on it monetarily. We certainly can't enjoy it in terms of pleasure. Don't go. So when we see the mariner make his way down south, like a Captain James Cook, breaking into the sea for the first time, what does he notice? Uh, he, when, he, when he first gets down there, what, he, he, there's this feeling of, well, you know, what, 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 is, what is here? And, and first he goes, oh, it's the land of mist and snow. And there are these beautiful glaciers um, as green as emerald. So maybe it is a beautiful, fantastical land. Maybe, it's, maybe it is this kind of El Dorado. But immediately he switches. And, oh, yeah, these, these, ice, I, these, these glaciers are green as emerald and kind of beautiful. But whoa, wait a minute. There's also a dismal sheen here. And when he looks in the dismal sheen, he says, I can't find any shapes or beasts I can't find any familiar figure at all. All I see is ice. And then, of course, the famous stanza, ice was here, ice was there, ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swamp. So this feeling that, that there is only ice and more ice and more ice, this idea of the, of the reduction of difference to the same. So we see this move almost bringing together these two traditions. One, the tradition that the Antarctic might be a, a, a sort of paradise, a magical emerald land but then immediately going from the early modern view of the Antarctic to the more medieval or ancient Greek view that it's a place of monstrosity where I can't recognize anything familiar at all. No shapes of beasts nor men we can. But then finally, um, after sort of moving through the early modern vision of, of the Antarctic and the uh, medieval vision of the Antarctic, he leaps to the more recent James Cook vision. All there is is ice. Ice was here, ice was there, ice was all around. So this is one reason that the mariner freaks out because he's in this realm where he cannot make meaning. He becomes desperate to make meaning. And one reason he shoots the albatross might be um, out of this frustration over his inability to make the world signify.